welcome everybody. I'd like to just start this out and say you are not the typical crowd that I speak to, and I'm so happy about that. It's, it's refreshing. Um, and one more thing that I would like to ask, just because it's personal curiosity, and I'll preface it by saying that I haven't been in law enforcement for three years, okay? So I'm no longer sworn. Um, how many people in this room have ever had an inquiry from law enforcement about their activities? A few, okay, cool. How many? Well, I'm, I'm talking about your technical activities. Your, your curiosity with electronic devices and computers specifically. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Um, there is this huge perception out there in the world that if you're at a hacker conference, you're going to be surrounded by people who are doing this for nefarious purposes, right? Like that, that you guys are out here trying to hack things and steal people's money and information and sell that on the dark web and all of those things. And, um, and throughout my law enforcement career, because I grew up as a total geek in high school and learning file systems on my father's knee, it was always my suspicion that that was just a load of BS and that that when you go to a hacker conference, like the vast majority of people are here just because they're curious about how things work and they want to know more, right? So um, that is actually the secret to my success in law enforcement is that every time, um, and, and by the way, I'm, I am um, among few in law enforcement, I've, I have had the honor to identify and arrest um, a couple of different DDoS suspects for major DDoS events and, um, and one for a major hacking event um, that, that actually went all the way to the US Supreme Court and, uh, and came through okay, so I've made some case law in this area. But the secret to my success was talking to people, right, because I'm not gonna assume ahead of time that, that their goal was bad unless it was obvious, and then I'm gonna be kind of curious about what they did. And how many people like talking about doing something after you do it, right? Like, it's, it's pretty cool. We get to do some cool stuff. The other secret to my success, honestly, is that I have hidden in plain sight my entire career, okay? I have over 30 years in law enforcement. Do I look like a cop? I didn't even really look like a cop when I was a cop. Um, and uh, most of that is in computer crimes, and I can walk into a forensics conference or a security conference or a hacker conference, and people just kind of ignore me. Um, or they pay the wrong kind of attention to me, and then they don't get very far because I was a cop for 30 years, so, um, <laughs> so it doesn't work out well. Um, so the, but I will tell you, when I walked into this conference, I just sauntered up to the badge thing, and. Um, was waiting in line for my really cool badge to see the coolest badge I ever got at a conference. Um, while I was waiting for that, um, two people cut right in front of me. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, dude, that's a mine. <laughs> right? So the law enforcement came out to me and I was like, follow the rules. <laughs> um, so for 31 years I've been in law enforcement. Um, the last three I have been in the civilian world. Um, and I will tell you, so far, I'm really preferring the civilian world. There's a lot more freedom out there um, to follow my curiosity and a lot more resources to do the sorts of things I want to be doing. Um, but for 22 plus years, um, I've been doing computer crimes and forensics and started my career back um, when law enforcement did not know crap about anything. So. Really, it was in the, and you could argue that's still the case in many jurisdictions, and I won't be there arguing that too much with you. Um, but it was in the, the mid to late 90s, uh, back when bulletin boards were a big thing, and back, uh, well, in 1998, my dad gave me a one gigabyte hard drive for Christmas and said, that is the last hard drive you'll ever need to be. It's one of the few things he was ever wrong about. <laughs> that has so much capacity, you're never going to fill it up. Uh, and, and now we regularly leave behind RAM that's you know 16 times that big, right? So um, there's a problem there. So I've done some pretty cool hacking cases. Anybody um, 
hear ever or be acquainted with uh, Rajiv Mitra, Jeeb from the 414 freaking club? No? Yeah? Is it someone you know? What's that? I said I know a couple of them. Okay, uh, I, I was asking about one specifically because I still have some questions I'd like to ask somebody who knew him. Um, so, <laughs> some investigations just never end. That took nine years of my life, and uh, if I ever meet someone, I'd like to have a beer and a conversation. Um, but uh, that case, I've done a lot of, um, uh, of uh, DDoS cases. I've done a lot of cases involving broken, smashed devices that were smashed on purpose, um, hoping to keep cops out of them. Um, and had the opportunity to deal with um, some cases where it felt like I was writing reports that belonged in comic books rather than in, in police files. Um, you know, Dr. Chaos and Riot Boy, wow. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I've had supervisors read my reports and go, what is this, right? I don't understand three quarters of the words in here and then I knew I needed to go back and rewrite that report. Um, so that they can understand it. Um, I've, I'm a certified computer forensic examiner. I've testified as an expert on a number, a lot of occasions, um, north of probably 200 at this point, um, in state and federal courts and now in the civil courts as well. Um, and I've had digital forensics cases go to both the Wisconsin Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court and both of those thankfully went um, the, in my view, the correct way. Um, people can argue, but uh, and they did, and it came out the way it should. I'm also a certified SANS instructor and a course co-author of 585, although I'm not currently teaching because my personal business has just taken off to a point where I don't have the time to dedicate to it right now. But maybe someday I'll go back and, and continue to do that. Um, and I did my master's degree in computer forensics at University College Dublin. Um, earned that in 2011. Uh, it was a blended program, so some online and some in-country. Um, one of the things my dad was very right about is that if there's something you want to do and something you have to do and you can make those things come together, it's a great way to live your life. Okay? So I wanted to go to Ireland. They had a master's program in forensic computing and cybercrime. I knew that the training programs that were available to law enforcement in my area weren't cutting it for me anymore. So I went to Ireland, um, and it's a great program if anyone's looking for a good one. Um, so I'm gonna start this um, talk with a picture, all right? And it's not the new picture, obviously. This is called Flammarion, um, and this is a depiction of the guy who first decided that the Earth probably wasn't flat, it was round. Um, and I like to think about technology in these terms, right? Like, we don't know what's possible until we pull that curtain aside and look beyond it at all of the things that are possible out there. And the vast majority of the world sometimes goes on thinking that things aren't possible, even when they're hearing that they are possible, right? Secure your RDP ports. No, thank you. Okay, here's your ransomware, right? Like, it's. Um, that could never happen to me, it's not a possibility, and, and then they get, they get nailed. So um, I, uh, my first degree was in graphic arts, I like to go back to graphic arts because I think sometimes those pictures do more for us to describe um, the way we look at the world versus the way the, the rest of the world sees the world. Um, it is a world of possibilities out there. And even in my field of, digital forensics, um, which is my, my pre preferred field. I'm getting pushed into incident response and, and security and some other places that are less comfortable for me. But even in that world, sometimes the way people see that world is so black and white that they forget about the possibilities. And so when I say I'm happy to be in this room talking to you, it's because um, people in this room are more likely to have already looked beyond that curtain um, at what's possible. Uh, and I would encourage you to keep doing that. So I want to talk about ground truth, right? Like those things that we know are absolute in this world. Uh, the things that we were taught to believe as true. Um, and I want to start out by saying, after 30 plus years of law enforcement, um, Oscar Wilde was right. The pure and simple truth is rarely pure and never simple, right? There are always 
um, colors to that grayscale. And there are always things that challenge our beliefs about what is true. The question is, are we willing to go there and look at those things and see where that possibility brings us? Or are we going to get stuck in what someone told us to be true? Uh, and I, I'm afraid that for the vast majority of people, um, we get stuck with what people tell us is true. And we stop testing the limits. I don't know how well you can see this. This is a game of giant Jenga. Um, played at the SANS DFIR Summit every year. Jared and I play a game. Actually, we play more like five or six. But this is a perfect Jenga game. Every piece is played all the way to the top. No pieces to go. And you can see the foundation down there is strong and true. And at the top, things are sort of tipping. So again, I saw this great analogy, right? Like, the further we go out towards the edges, the less stable things become. Uh, and that is actually the area where I like to work in forensics, is where, where the truth gets kind of fuzzy. The stuff that we were taught to be true um, has some exceptions, and I like to explore those exceptions. So what am I doing? I'm kind of hacking, right? Like that, that's what, uh, what you guys do. So I just want to talk about a few. How many people have background in forensics in this room? A good number. Okay, so for the rest of you, this isn't going to be anything that's going to be like totally over your heads. And for those of you in forensics, hopefully it won't be totally earth shaking, but it'll be enough to have you peek through those curtains a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about imaging because we were told some super duper straightforward rules about imaging about how when we do a full physical image of a hard drive, we go from the first bit to the last bit and we get every bit in between. And that is a good image if we hash it in that hash match, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you why that's not true um, and why we shouldn't believe it and why it's been common knowledge since 2012. We've just chosen to just kind of cover our eyes and ignore it. Um, and then I'm going to talk about firmware, which I was so glad to see these badges um, and to see that you guys are dumping firmware. I actually added a couple slides into this presentation right up there in the hallway about a case that came in this morning because um, it, it uh, has to do with, with uh, firmware and hardware. And I want to talk about hardware, okay? Um, because in forensics, we sort of ignore these things. We sort of ignore firmware and hardware. We assume that they're doing what they're supposed to do according to the manufacturer and that there's nothing sneaky going on there behind the scenes that we're not able to see. Um, same with hardware. Uh, and then I want to talk about what we do about it once we discover that the earth isn't flat in forensics, right? <laughs> that there are some exceptions to rules that we need to take into account. Like if for 15 years I've been writing police reports, swearing in front of a judge that I'm telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and then I find out that I'm not getting every bit of a hard drive, the next time I testify, what do I say? Right? Like I, I swear that I'm going to tell the truth. Well, really, that's not the truth. The truth is a little different from the fact that we're getting first to last. These are the slides I added. Does anybody know what this is just off the, the top of your head? It's a point of sale skimmer, right? So this was placed over a point of sale device uh, in order to capture some credit card information. We turn that sucker over, we see the back of the keypad, we start to see kind of a mess. It's hard to see from there, so I'll make it bigger for you. Um, that's where the brains live. Anybody, especially the people who made these badges, happy about the work that was done here? It's kind of a hack job, right? I mean, it's in, in, the least, in the least happy sense of the word. Again, a little bit hard to see with the lights up, um, but I'm told that's the way to do the video here, so we'll, we'll let it go. But what we see circled in the middle is a little, um, I think, 8 megabyte CMOS chip. That's where the data gets stored before it goes out of this device via Bluetooth. So we get a call Monday this week from another forensics company. And they say, hey, we have called no less than 10 labs. I've sent out the information about this chip. I've sent out pictures of this chip. And everybody says, nope, sorry, we do chip buffs, but we don't do that. And I looked at that, and I'm like, it's just a CMOS chip. Like, why don't you do that? Like, it's <laughs> that's probably the simplest scenario. OK, so when you guys are working on your hack the bag challenge, right, um, and you look at the little chip on the back, 
you'll see that it's nearly identical. It's not the same naked model, but you will be dumping the firmware out of that chip. So those 10 forensics companies that said no to this job, that's super simple, you guys, if you can accomplish this, will at least be able to do part of that work. And taking that chip off because it's been secured by hot glue is not going to be a super challenge. And there are readers for CMOS chips, right? So this is not a hard job. Um, so when I said, yeah, it shouldn't be too bad a challenge, he's like, what do you mean? He's like, everybody else said no. And I'm like, well, um, there's not much data on it. It's a simple chip. We have readers. We have all of the information we need about how the data is laid out on this. This shouldn't be a challenge at all. And it shouldn't even be expensive. He's like, well, if you get data out of this one, you can have all of our chip off work. I'm like, OK, we'll get your data. So bonus, right? Bonus. Um, so this is a lesson in why when somebody else looks at something and they go, that's a homemade piece of I don't know. And uh, you, they probably weren't looking to see which one of those chips held the data or which one of those might be a challenge, because there's nothing about that that's complex. It's just not made by. Samsung or by LG or by somebody else, right? Um, and so, so you guys would be like, oh yeah, let me let me try that. Right? Like that's that's not a big deal. <laughs> Let's go for it. Um, so that's what I I wanted to put this in here so that you could see that in the real world, outside of conferences, this sort of work is out there to be done, and there are a lot of companies that are turning it down because they see it as too esoteric to do. So. Um, that's the stuff that makes my work fun now. Um, in law enforcement, I probably would have had to send that chip out, right? Because, um, because there aren't too many labs that will do it. But I do know of another one that will. Um, Secret Service has a lab that will do those. So imaging, as examples go in this ground truth area and things that are plain, hiding in plain sight, this is, imaging is kind of an oldie but goodie. Um, Todd Shipley in 2012, he's an old forensics guy. Um, wrote a white paper talking about our, um, our imaging um, verbiage and what everybody was taught by National White Collar Crime Center and by the FBI CART team and by every other training organization out there and said, hey, we can't keep doing this because it's wrong. He said, yeah, you're getting a bit for bit image of the user addressable areas of the drive, but there are all sorts of other pieces of information you're not getting we got to stop saying this. And by the way, people, if they're smart, could be hiding data in those places that we're not getting. So um, back in 2012, I paid attention and I was like, ooh, I, I need to change what I'm doing here because I don't want to miss things and I don't want to be saying things on the stand that aren't true, right? Like I want to be doing the best case I can do. So the myth here is that when we create that drive image, we're making a full bit for bit image um, and in reality, we're only getting um, a bit for bit image of uh, the user addressable areas of that device. But we have these lovely tools that allow us to take that image and get a hash and match the hash afterwards, after, after that validation or verification process. Um, and, and we have plenty of people who are willing to say, oh, I got everything, we're good, move forward, write the report. It's, it's easy and simple. Um, it's easy and simple until you start realizing that there are all sorts of places in this drive, um, the service system area, uh, reserved area, servo information, uh, host protected area, firmware, all of these places on the drive, the, you know, the disk itself or within the, uh, the flash memory that um, can be altered by the user and could have information that's really important to a case. So some of this stuff are write blockers even picked up on, right? So in this case, we have a, uh, a picture of a, a, a write blocker that I used in a case where a long-term employee, he worked for the company for 13 years, turned in his computer after he left, he worked remotely, um, and they were like, he wiped the hard drive. Well, he didn't wipe it, and they thought, well, maybe he you know, reinstalled Windows. Uh, really what he did was put a different hard drive into that computer that had only been powered up six times, right? So he gave them back an intact computer, just not the right hard drive. So it had only been powered up five times when I got it. But interestingly, um, the right blocker sees this serial number. If we were to search that bit-for-bit bit image of that hard drive for that serial number, um, 
we should be able to find it, right? It should be there. It's not because it's not stored in the user addressable area. It's stored outside the user addressable area. So sometimes forensic examiners see this stuff and they go, okay, well, that's what it says the hard drive serial number is. I want to verify that. I'm going to search my image for it. Oops, I can't find it. And they go, I don't know, maybe it's encoded somehow. And then they call up UltraDoc or Tableau or whoever and they say, where'd that come from? I can't find it on the drive. And, and then UltraBlock or Tableau, Tableau sends them off to Todd Shipley's article and they go, oh, you know, I just pulled the curtain back and there's this whole new world out there. Uh, so that's out there uh, and it's, it's certainly an area that um, doesn't probably get enough attention in terms of what could be written um, to that area and what can be done to manipulate the boot of a drive um, uh, during, uh, during uh, the use of that hard drive. So, uh, so that's the number one example I want to use for you, the things that are hidden in plain sight from us. Firmware, uh, myth. Firmware doesn't really matter as long as it works. Um, and the reality is firmware really freaking matters. Like it matters all the time. Um, yes, we want it to be the stock firmware, but some of the most sneaky exploits right now are firmware exploits, right? So, um, so firmware can be used to turn on your computer even when it's turned off um, and to access it at the lowest levels. Um, and uh, used to be available only to nation states, but now it's available to all of us if we just go to WikiLeaks and download the information <laughs> and the tools. So, um, so it becomes problematic, right? Because those, those tools are now out there. So one example I like to use when I'm talking to cops is that you know, you're so, um, you think about computer users in, in a certain way. Um, farmers are hacking their own firmware in their tractors. Okay, so if farmers are hacking their firmware in order to avoid John Deere's um, man, you know, mandated service times once a year, um, then we ought to be aware of the fact that anybody with the right knowledge and tools can hack their own firmware. Um, so it's something we have to pay attention to. Um, firmware is everywhere. Um, I have this great pointer that I like to use in a, as an example. Unfortunately, Murphy's Law says the battery is not fully charged. So, um, so this, is, uh, this, this is a pointer that does some firmware tricks. So I can point it at my screen or I can point it at that screen and it will show pointers either place without use of a laser. And it's interacting um, with with that device. Um, little Bluetooth magic or a little Wi-Fi magic in between um, and you have, uh, you have a really cool toy. Um, but USB keyboards, webcams, sound cards, graphic cards, um, one major place this comes up, data, reco data recovery company, um, Gilware started as a data recovery company um, 15, 16 years ago. One of the most common things that comes in is people who turn over to us their 64 or 128 gigabyte USB um, devices that they've bought off of eBay or Amazon for 14 bucks, right? And they go, I got this huge USB. I put 64 gigabytes of pictures on this and there's nothing left. What happened? Well, when you take it apart, it's actually an eight gigabyte chip, right? So you can't put 64 gigabytes in an eight byte chip, but, but eight gigabyte chip, but you can change the firmware on that eight gigabyte chip to make it show the user that it's a bigger USB drive so that you can make more money. Um, so this is one very common way that this happens. Um, it can also be used by bad guys, and I've had the um, great opportunity to see it being used in cases where reporters are being spied on um, and where bad guys are using altered USB firmware in order to create spy devices. So, um, so watch those USB keys, they're still kind of an issue. Um, but GPS devices, traffic signals, routers, printers, vehicles, everything's got firmware in it and we can mess with all of that firmware um, and make things do um, things other than they were designed to do. Uh, here's the next picture I love to show. Looks like a hacker, doesn't it? Your traditional hacker. This is Trenton. 
Um, he works for me. He's not a hacker. He's uh, actually a great coder. But what he's doing right there is um, decrypting however many virtual machines are there from, from, a, <laughs> from a ransomware case. Uh, the problem is that we start looking for you know, very computer savvy people and we should be looking for this guy, really. The guy who figures out that they can change that firmware in their tractor. Um, or better yet, the kid who from the age of tiny decides, hey, those limits, they're not mine. They're somebody else's limits and I'm just gonna keep pushing beyond them and figure out how to make this thing do what I want it to do. Um, so if we're not looking for those people or at those people, and there's a whole room full of those people here, I'm pretty sure, um, then we're missing out on a lot. Why does it matter? It can be easily exploited. It's not designed for security. It's small. It's fast to write. Um, we see Meltdown and Spectre. They were firmware, it, firmware exploits. Um, the Intel firmware vulnerability is, uh, is, is out there and in use. Um, I, this is actually a screenshot from a case. I pulled that out of unallocated space. Um, the Intel Active Management Technology uh, the, the screenshot. And so, so really, if you've got that Intel chip and someone uh, has, can uh, remotely get into your computer even if it's been turned off. And, uh, and in this case, they could also turn the power off on you. This person's computer was doing all sorts of crazy stuff that, uh, and they didn't know why. And unfortunately, they were in a, uh, in a, in a very large um, big name company uh, and that company was kind of owned at the firmware level. So, uh, so it was kind of an ugly mess. Um, unlike um, operating system, firmware rarely has easily update market mechanisms, but you can go out usually and find on Russian or Chinese sites um, the software that you need to interact with all sorts of different firmware. We can use it to help us access devices that otherwise can't be accessed. Um, and in the mobile forensics field, anybody playing with mobile devices at all? Um, firmware can really help us get into devices that aren't acting right or that are under, otherwise inaccessible um, through, through security mechanisms. So it's, it's definitely something to be, um, to be looking at. Hardware, the myth is the hardware doesn't really matter so long as it works. Um, I don't know too many forensics courses that ever talk about hardware and firmware, how they interact together and how they affect what we see later on. Uh, in reality, hardware really matters. Um, and it doesn't necessarily even matter whether it works or not. If you're able to get that hardware to work, then, um, then you're gonna be in better shape. So um, sometimes we just need to go there to get around a problem. The, uh, the picture here on your left is a Qualcomm chip on a phone. Um, this is the first chip off, chip back on case I'm ever aware of. Um, so at, at Gilbert we said, hey, we could take chips off, read them directly. Um, if we get encrypted data back, um, we know that there's several chips involved in that encryption. What if we um, put that chip back on another phone and replaced chips too, could we get around some of that? And the answer is yes, you can. Not gonna work with every phone, but there are several phones that we've had this process work for. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, next one is a little SD card. Um, thing was broken off, but in, in ways that we can still get around, and so we just did some spider wire soldering, um, it got the, the diagrams to get the right connections, and then did a physical read of the data from that card, reconstructed it, and got the data back from it. Uh, and the third one um, is a donor phone next to an evidence phone. This is from a Chicago homicide case, Chicago PD homicide case, where a body was burned in a barrel. Um, along with his phone, um, and uh, the, the person obviously wasn't identifiable. Um, the phone looked like a hockey puck, uh, but we got probably 98% of the data back out of that phone, including the guy's last pictures and his last communications, and they were able to identify the guy and, and solve their homicide. Hardware mattered in that case, right? Like, and many labs would just look at that and go, 
not a chance. Um, I'll, I'll go through some more pictures of that case in a little bit. Um, repairs and replacement and reconfiguration can solve some problems that other methods can't. You can go at um, these things all you want with a rate blocker and read and read and read, but, um, but sometimes we have to go beyond that to get data out of devices. Um, board swaps, chip swaps, head swaps for hard drives or, or um, board swaps for phones um, can get us to data that is otherwise totally inaccessible. Um, alternative input methods, um, so you see the iPad there, that was a password protected iPad at one point, but somebody left accessibility options on and we were able to insert a keyboard and do some, um, do some hacking in order to get into that particular device. Um, and then I'm making that one a little bit bigger. This is an iPhone board. We've um, sprayed it with some, um, well, in, in this case, we actually used the, the freeze spray, right? <laughs> but you could use your canned air turned upside down and, and, uh, and do it that way. But this was a phone that was stuck in a boot loop, an iPhone stuck in a boot loop. Uh, it would come up, it would overheat, and it would shut down. If you spray it with cold air as it's coming up and frost everything, it becomes obvious which chips are the problem, right? Uh, and then you swap out those components, this phone will work beautifully, and it will boot all the way. Okay, so most people would say, that phone is a hockey puck, I'm on to the next phone. Um, that would be a mistake, because you will miss your evidence. Um, great example. So this is the example that pulled me out of law enforcement and into the private sector. Um, so for probably the last 10 years of my career, I had a lot of different people saying, hey, Cindy, come work for us. Like, here's the amount of money. What are you still doing in law enforcement? There's all sorts of stuff to be done out here. Well, then I went for a tour of uh, Gilbert's Data Recovery Lab to talk to them, to consult with them about starting a forensics business. I wasn't gonna be involved in it, I was just consulting with them. And uh, walked through their data recovery lab and a guy named Greg Andrzejewski was working on an SD card that a wedding photographer had accidentally reformatted after coming back from Hawaii and shooting a high dollar celebrity wedding. She was in trouble, right? So, um, <laughs> so she sent this SD card in and you reformat it, anytime we read this with Windows, what is it gonna tell us? It's an empty card, it's all zeros. I can apply my right blockers and I can take a physical image of that drive, first bit to last bit, all I want, and it is always gonna show me all zeros, okay? Um, in law enforcement, if that had come to me, USB drive, SD card, I put it on the right blocker, I preview it, and it's all zeros, I'm on to the next piece of evidence. And I've worked child exploitation cases for 17 years, okay? So there's a lot of pieces of evidence. So I watched Greg that day, I happened to get lucky, um, recover 300 plus images from an SD card that read all zeros. What kind of magic is that, right? <laughs> like, wait. Like, I'm supposed to be an expert, and you just did that, and I always thought the data recovery people were just sort of forensics light, right? Um, Ed's, Ed's nodding. <laughs> yes, we have these perceptions that we come into this business with, right? That, that data recovery people are just getting people's data back. It's just, you know, what did they delete? I'll get that back. What's, yeah, so, uh, but this was some sort of magic where I was just like, Ooh, whoa, wait. Like, <laughs> how did you do that, and how can I be involved in doing that? So then I started to read more and learn more about flash memory, and Greg gave me, a, I, and I knew some of this, like I had heard academically a lot of this stuff, but until I saw it in action, I didn't realize, you know, how fooled I was about, about what was visible versus what wasn't. So we have the file system level, our software-based images can reach there and understand it. Through Windows, through Linux, through whatever, you're looking at it through an operating system, all you're gonna get is that level. On these flash memory devices, USB devices, uh, um, thumb drives or flash memory or even the flash hard drive, they have this flash translation layer that just basically sits there and says, here's what I want to show you and you're not seeing anything else. Okay? And I like to think of that as the wizard from the Wizard of Oz. Do not look behind this curtain, right? Um, because everything back here is stuff you no longer need to know about. 
I've been told to reformat this drive, so all you can see is zeros. But underneath that lays the NAND flash memory. And that raw NAND, if you can directly read that chip rather than reading it through an SD card, um, has data on it until garbage collection and wear leveling happen, um, which is less common with SD cards and USB devices than it is with more modern hard drives. But here we are, above that, we see the logical level, and we can get a physical image of the logical level. Okay, so that's the part that was screwing with my head because I thought I'm getting a physical image of this. My tools tell me that, my processes tell me that, my experience tells me that. I've done this a hundred times. But all I'm getting is anything that the Wizard of Oz tells me I can see. If we're able to go down below the flash translation layer, then we can see the rest of it. By the way, this was put together by a marketing person, so there isn't a thing underneath there that makes any sense whatsoever to people who are talking about it. <laughs> so if I erase it, uh, the stuff at the top is gone. The stuff behind the wizard's curtain, though, it's still there. And the worst thing people can do is start messing with that device and trying to get it back through a file system read, right? Like the worst thing they can do is apply power to that and start working on it because you're not gonna get to it that way. You have to take the chip off, do a direct read, and then put that million piece puzzle back together again. So there's two avenues of extraction. We can either do uh, a normal device interface through SATA, EMMC, SDIO, all of the different interfaces we have, or we can do a direct read of the flash memory of one or more chips. So in this case, we're seeing a more modern SSD where we have removed all of the chips from that device. We will do direct reads on each and every one of those chips, and then we will put together that five billion piece jigsaw puzzle. Whoa, oh, it's hard, it's not easy, and it takes a long time. But if you look underneath there with these tools, they have tools that help you um, to figure out the patterns and to visualize them. And it, it reminds me of my graphic arts days. I go back and I go, oh, that's pretty, it must be right. And half the time, it's right. So, uh, so if you can get the right tools to do this work, um, there is data there and you can bring it back, but there's significant puzzle uh, building involved in it. So why don't we just do it all the time? <laughs> right? Like chip off everything. Um, and I was there for a minute um, until Greg said, slow down, Sydney. It's okay. We can't do this all the time. Um, because a lot of times those uh, flash NAND chips, the NAND flash chips, um, have industry standard um, interfaces. And they're not so easy to read. Or the data layout is proprietary. Um, or you have identical chip after chip by making model and firmware and you look underneath and the patterns are all totally different, right? Like they haven't used a standard layout on the, on the memory underneath. Um, encryption is another problem. If that drive is encrypted, then the, the data underneath is also encrypted. But, um, and, and the other issue here is that when we're dealing with these larger drives that have um, wear leveling and garbage collection that happens on a really regular basis and trim commands and all of that stuff, that gets rid of a lot of the data that we would be after anyway, pretty automatically uh, and pretty quickly. So the, the more modern devices, the larger devices, there's actually less chance of recovery from those, although we do find in spare area and in over-provisioned area on these devices that we're getting back lots of little files and lots of versions of little files. So it's still not an impossibility. Seems straightforward, but it's not, right? Like the truth here is not simple. Um, and oh yeah, it can be physically destructive to the original device, right? Like once you take those chips off, um, depending on the device, putting them back on um, is not necessarily going to be a successful thing, or if it is, it may not last for a long time. So when I tell you we're doing chip-off, chip-ons for phones, we are. We're doing them on a fairly regular basis now and having some good success with that, but we're not handing that back to the customer and saying, hey, here's your LG phone, go ahead and use it, right? Because that's a temporary fix for us to get that data out um, and then to move forward. So let's talk about that homicide case just a little bit because I think this is a great example. 90% um, of law enforcement labs who got a phone in in this condition would consider that phone to be toast. OK, 
okay, um, and they would not have gone um, any further. Uh, the phone itself was melted to the point where getting the micro SD card out was pretty difficult. And then once the SD card came out, does it look like it's in good condition? Has anybody heard any rumors about how flash memory is heat sensitive? Okay, so all, all of these issues should be a problem. Um, by the way, don't believe that last thing. Flash memory, in my experience, is so tolerant to all sorts of, uh, of abuse. Like you can throw it under salt water, you can, um, you, you can bury it for a couple of years, you can burn it like this, um, and, and we're still able to do some pretty amazing things to get data back. Um, it, it's a pain in the butt. And this one, by the way, the whole lab would stunk like burning plastic. So this, this was not a pleasant case to work on. So that is the original phone. If you ever have a battery that looks like that, it's time to get that battery out of your building. Okay, that's, that's my safety advice. Um, or put it in an arson can and wait for it to explode because it's going to at some point. Um, so that's Mike's hand. Um, Mike is our, one of our best chip off guys. He did chip off work in Afghanistan um, and he's really fabulous at it um, and, and has the steadiest hands of anybody I know. Uh, Mike did the chip off on this, uh, basically um, took the chip off of the donor board uh, and we replaced it onto the other board and were able to pull the data out. So that's the chip as it came off of the burn board. You can see the nice clean spot it came out of, right? Um, he'll clean that up, make it pretty. Uh, might have to reball it, might have to resolder it, depends on the job, um, but then we can get that data out. So, um, so we were able to get back like most of the data. Um, all of the data came off of that flash memory chip and we were able to recreate it. We got like a 90% read on the SD card, um, so we didn't get everything and there was a little bit of corruption there, but, but uh, what we got back helped to solve that case. So what do we do about all this, right? Because a lot of what I'm talking about um, is those areas where we go, now is this just forensics or is this like science fiction, right? Like is this, is this where science meets fiction and we're doing stuff that didn't used to be considered to be possible? Um, and the thing is, the longer you're around, and I've been around for 30 plus years in law enforcement and, and 25 now or something and doing forensic, the longer you're around, the more you keep hearing, oh, that stuff that used to be impossible, we're not doing like all the time, right? It gets, it, um, and, and the thing is, we move forward, but oftentimes um, we don't stop to say, hey, that's no longer true, so stop writing it in your reports and stop swearing to it every time on the stand. And, um, and this seems like a simple advice, though, but... I will tell you, as someone who's testified a number of times, the first time I wrote a report and then testified that, no, this isn't a complete image of the hard drive. This is an image of all the user addressable areas of the hard drive. There was a very smart defense attorney on the other side that said, hey, Cindy, you and I have done a lot of cases together, and I've heard you testify lots of times. Why is this different than that other one? Like, why did you used to get all the data off and now you're not? Is there something different about this hard drive? <laughs> right, and then you, then you have that moment where you go, oh crap, <laughs> um, and you go, no, no, I was wrong all those other times that I testified, right, like, I was wrong, <laughs> and that's a really hard thing to say, and the problem is you have to follow it up and say, I was wrong, but not in a way that substantially changed that case, right, like, I just learned that not only can I get all of that user addressable stuff, but there's other stuff out there that I could get to if I need to dig that deep. Um, and so what to do about it is we can't be so afraid of those moments where we go, <gasps> how do I explain this? Um, that we just take the easy route and say, I'm not gonna explain it, I'm just gonna keep doing it the way I've always done it and hope nobody else notices because it's too hard, right? Um, it's not, we just have to educate people as we go and we have to keep learning and reaching and growing. Um, and when our understanding changes, we have to be um, humble enough to say, I didn't know, or I don't know, or I was wrong. Um, and that actually gets harder the more experience and expertise you have under your belt. The longer I'm around, the more I know I don't know crap, right? Like that's, that's really what it comes down to. 
which makes me a good forensics person because I'm always questioning the stuff that I assume to be true, um, which is, after all, what science is about, right? So, um, so that's, uh, that's really the message I have for you about those things that are hiding in plain sight. It's all around us. Like, it's not just in this conference room. The stuff that we believe to be true in forensics is our understanding of forensics at this point in time. And it, like I've shown you a few examples here, but there are many others um, of, of how that is just going to expand and grow as time moves forward and technology changes. So any questions? I have with me, I don't know, you, there might be a geek or two in the room. This was a shirt that is from Anonymous in Amsterdam. Um, I was at the SANS conference in Amsterdam, and a guy walked up to me and he's like, Cindy, I want you to have this. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like oh, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Thanks, I have a shirt. Um, and I said, you know, I can't wear this at work, right? <laughs> like my, my boss would get upset. Um, but he said, I'm giving this to you to let you know that some of us in Anonymous, and he said this in a really nice Amsterdam accent, appreciate the fact that you're keeping our streets clean, right? Um, he's like, because our goal, when it, we set out, was to make things right. And there's so many people who are out, like, DDoSing, um, you know, SeaWorld and children's hospitals. Um, and I want you to know that we appreciate the people who are policing our streets, too. So I brought this shirt to give away, though. So if anybody's a European large and has an interest, um, <laughs> by the way, European large is smaller than a US large, just for those of you who don't know. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how to give this shirt away. But I think what I'm going to do is uh, give it to Mike, and have, who's not in the room anymore because apparently, you know, he can't be bothered. <laughs> He's fixing the video. Uh, but I'll get to Mike, and um, and some challenge in the next couple of days will include this shirt as well. Okay, so that's your bonus because I can't think of a question to ask you guys that that might uh, might work out. But any questions um, just based on this? So not directly. I'm just wondering how is um, was curious about um, chain of custody evidence preservation when you're, when you're dealing with things that small. Does that become a bigger issue when it comes time to testify in terms of? What can, what's questioned and how you handle things, how to, how to put a specific challenge that you've gone into? It, it sure can, uh, especially with flash memory, because if I do a, a direct read of NAND memory and Crawl does it or some other company does it, that direct read of NAND memory, if we were to hash it after the rebuild, they may rebuild it slightly different than I do. And it's not going to be the same. Like if we hit it the same, that would be amazing. Um, so it, it can be an issue, and we just have to be prepared to say, you know, sort of like RAM is never the same. Cell phones are going to be rarely the same if you if you image them twice. Those things that are actively changing um, are a little bit different. Um, so the chain of custody is usually of that physical device, but it can be of the data too, and so it can get a, a little messy because they can have one exhibit number for, for our dump and a different one for another dump, and people can spend hours arguing which one's right, even though above the flat translation layer, the data is all exactly the same. So uh, you know that billion piece soft, the puzzle that we're putting back together, if we rebuild some bits differently underneath, it's not necessarily going to show up above. So, um, so yeah, it, it can be an issue, and it's one that we we still are working through. I think honestly, that's part of the reason collecting RAM still doesn't get done. It's like, how do I say this is the correct image of RAM? Because the next one I take will be different. Hey. Hi. So. One, one of the things that, that has come up in front of those courses is how do you handle encrypted device history? Say, with my phone, you, you can no longer request that I unlock my phone so you can examine it. Is, is that really true? You can't do anything? Your your SOL, or can you get past that phone? It depends. <laughs> There's your expert answer. Um, so, 
if we have a court order that allows us to try to, to break that encryption or to come up with a hardware or firmware way around it, um, we may be able to get past it. It's, it really depends on the make and model of the phone, though, um, and the technology involved. Uh, this is really prevalent with iPhones right now, right? Like, um, if you're affiliated with law enforcement, you may have the ability to get a get great key extraction, which is going to have more data in it, even for a password protected phone, um, which they could write passwords on, um, than you can from any civilian available tool. And so, so it's not an equal world out there in a lot of different ways. Uh, and whether we can get around encryption on a particular phone really depends on the make and model of the phone, the version of the operating system on that phone, um, and, and, and potentially other things as well. Chipsets can make a difference, a huge difference. So every, every phone has its own individual problem. We have time for one more question, and it's right here. Have you ever been told to stop your investigation, like the email investigation? Have I ever been told to stop my investigation? Ah, oh, man, you know, when I retired, <laughs> did you hear me just ask the whole audience, did, it, did anybody know Rajiv Mitra? If you did, I'd like to have a conversation with you. Yeah, no, I have never been told to stop an investigation. Usually what happens is that so many other investigations come in after it that it dies a natural death. Um, so. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like you're a chef at a 12 burner stove and everything's boiling over at once. Um, that thing that requires your attention the least is most likely to slide from your attention. So I've never been ordered to stop, um, but I usually follow the rules and I'm very nice, right? Like I, I'm very nice to the people I talk to, whether they're a bad guy or a good guy, and, um, and I try to follow rules and get permission sometimes. <laughs> okay, thanks. I'll be around for a little bit.